Hello, dinky doomy hearties. It's just me, Scotty McClue, the one stop broadcaster, hashtag floatai, the first lord of the internet, all in uppercase, and of course, the world's most humble man. That goes without saying. Now, this morning I was broadcasting live, I was streaming on TikTok and the Scotty McClue YouTube channel as Scotty McClue, the world's top talk show which I would like you to go and have a look at because there's 3,000 videos that cover a fair bit of uh, the history of Scottish broadcasting and British broadcasting. But um, it's something else I'd popped up to talk to you about. It was the fact that we were talking about diesel engines or heavy oil engines, and I'd mentioned the Gardner heavy oil engine from uh, Manchester, from Patricroft, a very famous oil engine. Now, you might wonder, well, what's this got to do with you? Well, the thing is, we're talking about the boat that took the body of the late, great Sir Winston Churchill um, up the Thames to Waterloo on the day of his funeral in January 1965. And somebody said, Scotty, you remember 1965. How old are you? And I thought, <coughs> well, at that time, I was nine years of age. Pardon me. And I thought to myself, it's interesting people now asking about the way we were. Now, at the moment, people feel the world is a very dangerous place because you have a number of thoughtless and careless and godless individuals um, who are thinking about what can they be up to next. But the only way they can think what they can be up to next is because the world is a wonderful place right now. And the world has always been a very dangerous place. So if we're talking my lifetime, I was brought up and I had my grandfather with me. I was 14 when, when he died. And he was born in 1881, and I knew him really, really well. He was a wonderful influence in my life, as were my mother and father and so many of uh, the wonderful family that I was privileged to be brought up in. And as I say, he was born in 1881, so if he were around now, he would be 142 so I knew somebody really well who was born 142 years ago. And then also I met a man who was quite an old man then, but when he was a young man, he wrote to an older man whose grandfather remembered Bonnie Prince Charlie walking about Rome. And Bonnie Prince Charlie died in, I think it was about 1784, it might have been 1786, but something like that. So I knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who knew Bonnie Prince Charlie. And the guy was a Scottish aristocrat, so he probably knew him quite well and would speak to him. Hi, Charlie, how are you getting on? And um, he remembered him walking about Rome because, of course, he's buried in the Vatican, King Carlos. The grave of Bonnie Prince Charlie is in the Vatican. And a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, was going to Rome uh, on a visit and he uh, said he would be calling in um, at St. Peter's uh, Basilica in the Vatican. And I said, well, can you get me a photo of Bonnie Prince Charlie's tomb? And he did. He actually brought it back. And somebody had told me that the late Queen Mother, um, the mother of the late Queen Elizabeth II, um, who only died at the age of 102 in um, 2001, I think it was. Um, and she uh, had actually contributed or paid for the restoration of King Carlos's tomb, Bonnie Prince Charlie, the king over the water, as the Scottish regiments talk about in Gaelic when they're toasting the queen or the king. They also toast the king over the water. Uh, so it just got me thinking about time and about the way we were. Now, when I say the world was a dangerous place, there were all sorts of diseases about in 1881 and going right back through history that wiped out the population or a good whack of the population. So things like the Black Death itself, the plague, 
Then the great fire of London cured that by burning the whole place down. Then you had um, things like diphtheria, polio, cholera. Where I worked, one of the radio stations I worked was uh, in an old church, a former church. And in the grounds of that was a mass grave from 1843 or 1847 when the plague had hit Lancashire, Preston in Lancashire. And of course, Charles Dickens wrote hard times in Preston in Lancashire because they were having very, very hard times. And uh, then you had all these illnesses wiping people out. People were losing huge numbers of family, infant mortality. And then you come up to the First World War when Grandfather, I told you about, was fighting in the trenches with the Argyles. And my other grandfather was in Gallipoli, mounted on horseback with the Scottish horse. And then uh, you had the Second World War. So what led up to these was there was a huge crisis in 1911 in the world. So the outcome of the crisis, the First World War, crisis for everyone, people losing most of their generation, third of a generation perished on the Somme. Then you had trouble in Europe in the 1930s <clears throat> and the rise of uh, the Nazis and what have you. You had problems in Spain, you had problems in Poland, problems in Czechoslovakia. Problems in Germany, problems in the Balkans, and problems in France, of course. And then go back to 1789, big problems in France. 1917, problems in Russia, total revolution. And um, when you look at it, there's always been a crisis. When I was born, there was the Suez Crisis, Britain on the brink of, uh, of, of a war in the Middle East. You know that, you had the fall of the British Empire, the rise and fall of all empires, European empires, the Roman Empire, the, the Spanish Empire, the Armada, the Portuguese Empire, the Belgian Empire in the Congo, treating the Congoese terribly badly, all that sort of stuff. So you can't just point the finger at the British Empire. But we're talking about Churchill's death there. And I was thinking about the way we were. So the lovely thing is that I can come to you right now via the internet, via the video platforms. I couldn't do that then. There was no internet. There was, you know, there were no mobile phones. So you didn't have that. There was no search engines. So if you wanted to find out something, you had to find a book in the library that had been gifted to us by the late, great Andrew Carnegie, another Scotsman from Dunfermline, who had made it from poverty to the richest man in the world. Well, when I say the richest man in the world, having the most money in the world. I would say I'm the richest man in the world because I get to talk to you. I get to know you and things like that. So, you know, the only true wealth is actually life itself. So there's no point in saying I'm the richest man in the world just because you've got the most money. Sometimes you've got people like at the moment, you could look at billionaires and you could think to yourself, do you know, these are poor we souls, poor we souls, they might have what they think is all the money in the world, but what is the quality of their life? How much do they value their fellow human beings? How much do they love their human beings? How much do they love their own family? Because very often when somebody's fought and kicked and scratched and bit and done everything to get money, um, very often the family break up. Their husband or wife leaves them, takes the children, and they end up staying in some little so-called 
luxury flat. And they are billionaires. They could have anything they like, but money cannot buy love. Although it can come in a wee bit handy when you're buying your round, I have to say. So, from that point of view, but as my late great father would say, you can only wear one suit. So along came the Second World War, and cometh the hour, cometh the man, that's where Churchill stepped into his own shoes, and he had to fight. Churchill was bullied as a wee boy. His parents kind of abandoned him to the public school system. He was uh, called Copper Nut. He was beaten very badly in school. His mother, he begged and begged his mother, Jenny, a beauty, a great beauty, and his father, Randolph, to come to the school and see all his work. He never turned up. He was a poor wee soul. But he got on with it. So 1965, oh yes, so I was going to say, so then you had the crisis in the 30s, and that led to the Second World War, where again both grandfathers turned out for their country and the Home Guard. My father was young when it started, so he went into the Home Guard, kicking open doors looking for German paratroopers that had plummeted to earth when they had been bombing the ports of Greenock and Port Glasgow and Glasgow and Clyde Bank. And then he got called up and off he went for six years in all sorts of dangerous, dangerous theatres of war. A paratrooper dropped in to Nijmegen to defend the bridgehead in Operation Market Garden under Montgomery. And uh, then off to Norway. And uh, it was part of the liberating force for the airport. Dropped in, liberated the airport, next day taken out again. Then uh, he, he was there at the time when they were making heavy water. You'll see a lot of it in uh, the movie, The Heroes of Telemark with Kirk Douglas. My father was in Norway at that time. And then he was in Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, just after the bomb had been dropped, just walking about in their army uniforms, senior officers walking about. No thoughts about radiation and all that sort of thing. Japan. Then he was sent to India for guard duty at the most dangerous times when uh, India was a revolting. Mount Batten was the finest uh, last viceroy. And uh, he had to uh, partition India. But of course, a, as usual, when Britain had to leave somewhere in a hurry, it was a bit of a mess. Millions died in the partition between India and Pakistan. There was a secret sitting in a safe that had they known about it, had Mountbatten known about it, he could probably have hung on and things could have been different. I won't be so base as to tell you what that secret was, but I do know. Sitting in a safe, things could have been different in India. Anyway, that was my father. Then I born in the 1950s. And uh, right into the Suez crisis, Eden had taken over as Prime Minister Churchill, had resigned, and Eden had finally got the job he so much deserved. Then he got stabbed in the back, and um, that was that. And uh, Harold Macmillan took over as Prime Minister. I remember him. Now, in those days, what's interesting, the way we were, we're talking about the way we were, but what's interesting about those days was that you never really saw politicians. It wasn't in those days show business for ugly people. So you never really saw politicians. In an emergency or a crisis, the prime minister would broadcast on the six o'clock or the nine o'clock news, read by an absolute gentleman in a tweed jacket. They didn't go for any glamour or anything. They just came on and said, good morning, here is the news, or good evening, here is the news. And they read it, no film, no movies, no ENG, no digital, 
just a gentleman in a tweed jacket reading the news. And there were some lady announcers at the British Broadcasting Corporation at the time, started by the late great Sir John Reith, who was around when I was a child. I've had the privilege of meeting his family and talking to them, his daughter, his granddaughters, you know, very interesting. His son-in-law, wonderful. And... Um, I think about that sort of sense of innocence. I know all sorts were going on, but they asked the people to participate. It mattered who you voted for. It mattered if you were to the left of centre or to the right of centre. If you backed a party called Labour who stood for the working man, and was represented by people of real conviction who genuinely believed that there must be more fairness in life, that there must be a little more money on the wage for the miners and the steel workers and the railwaymen. The Taft Vale Railway case, the March of the Blanketeers, the Peterloo Massacre. The Jarrow Crusade. All these people that had really worked over the years. But it goes right back to when the steam engine came in and the Luddites thought that they were going to lose their livelihoods because of the Industrial Revolution brought in by the wonderful James Watt from Greenock in Scotland. Moved to Birmingham and joined with Matthew Boulton and you had the firm of Boulton and Watt. So the great man passed away in January 1965 at the age of 90 in his 91st year. And the funeral was a state funeral that was all day, well, up till late lunchtime. I think they arrived in Bladen at the churchyard for the committal of, uh, of his body, uh, just Bladen, the little church just opposite Blenheim Palace where he was born, um, where his father was the son of the Duke of Marlborough. And... Um, after that, I got on my bike and went down with my Saturday sixpence, two and a half P, to get some sweeties from the sweet shop. And uh, sixpence, you had six pennies. You could get a halfpenny tray and a penny tray. I could have got 12 sweets from the halfpenny tray or six from the penny tray. Penny dainties. Highland toffee, all sorts of little things, a white mouse, <laughs> you know, um, an oyster, I think they were called. What were the little pink ones that melted in your mouth? You could get fruit gums, you could get sour plumes, you could get victory V's, you could get cough candy. You could get Russian caramels. You could get Everton mints. You could get striped balls. You could get um, bullseyes. You could get uh, little extra strong mints. Uh, you could get acid drops. You could get spangles. You could even go for a Five Boys chocolate bar from Fry's. You could go for um, a chocolate cream. You could go for a, a small uh, Cadbury's chocolate bar. These sort of things, individually wrapped. Wonderful choices. You could buy some sweetie cigarettes and pretend you were grown up at the time because people smoked. And then you went back for your lunch maybe a bowl of soup, a bowl of scotch broth, homemade, some mince and potatoes, and for your pudding, steamed pudding and custard, something like that. That's how we got like this. 
Uh, you know, so you worked away. Uh, Saturday night, you had a set menu. Saturday night, pie, beans and chips. Oh, beef olives. Oh, that's a lot of stuff from the local butcher. And you actually lent on a cow. Well, the carcass of a cow that was hanging up in the butchers. While well, you talked to them, there was sawdust on the floor. There was an open window. There were steaks lying in the window. There was mince in the window. So you could see what was offered. You could buy some dripping to fry it all with. And if the butcher, the butcher was friendly with the farmer and the farmer had hens, there were eggs for sale in the butchers. He came out and uh, the front of his jacket was covered in blood. And he would wipe his hands. Say, hello, son, what can I get you? How's your mother keeping? Say, could I have two chops, please? And he would take a big cleaver and go about there, wallop, wallop. And he would give you your chops and then he would wrap them up in a piece of brown paper. So there was never any talk about germs and about things like that. And if you look now, you see people squirting um, antiseptic onto where they're cutting up the meat in the supermarket. And they're going to put your meat on top of the antiseptic. That's going to come in and kill off the good bacteria in your gut. Mm. So you didn't really, if you could get the bus, I got the bus to school sometimes. It, you could get tuppence, two old pennies, one p now. Or you could get um, three halfpence if you walked a stop and you went into the shop and got yourself a couple of halfpenny sweeties. You could get the train return ticket 4D. So less than 2P return on the steam train. Chuffa, 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 chuffa. You had to, um, you could run and jump on if you thought you were going to miss it when it was moving. Bit dangerous, but we did it. You could have a laugh by opening the window in the tunnel and smoking every day. <laughs> you know, silly things like that. A level of innocence. Sometimes a big boy put a smaller boy in his shoulders and they blew out a, a, a used gas mantle that was struggling at the end. Because there was gas lighting in houses and in the stations and up the closes in the tenements in Glasgow, in the west of Scotland. Gas lighting. And Leary the Lamplighter, from that wonderful poem of Robert Louis Stevenson, the writer of Treasure Island, Leary the Lamplighter, Yes, O'Leary, see a little child and wave to him tonight. Because the wee boy at the window in Edinburgh, my father's a banker and as rich as he can be. Yes, and when he was older, this wee boy dreamed of going round with Leary the lamplighter. Leary, I'll come round at night and light the lamps with you. Beautiful little poem from a child's garden of verses. So we had no phones or anything like that, so we read books. I was taught to read by my mother when I was about three. And I've loved, loved books ever since. I'm up to my neck in books, but I still refer to them. And I still get joy and pleasure from reading them. The way we were. And... Things didn't cost a fortune because people didn't have a fortune. You rented a house at a fair rent. The landlord saw that that house was habitable. You had things like you shared a lavatory if you were in a tenement with several other people. For some reason, people didn't get sick from sharing the lavatory. There weren't notices everywhere telling you what to do. Wash your hands. Be wary of germs. Frighten the life out of you all. There wasn't any of that. You got on with life. You played in the mud. You climbed trees. You fell off your bike. When you were old enough, you got a bike, probably second hand, because a new one. And I was very lucky. At one point, I did get a new one after I'd had a second-hand one. And the new one was £20. And my mother even splashed out seven and sixpence 
for a stand for it. And I wrote it for years and years and years. And at the age of 12, I asked for a job and got a Saturday job, which took me towards 15, that paid two half crowns, five shillings on the boats, working as cabin boy on the local boats. Loved it, loved it. Met beautiful people that I look back now. They were very stern at the time. But when I look back, I think what beautiful, beautiful people they actually were. So that was the 1960s. I got my job in 1968 and kept it to what, about 1970. And jobs were plentiful. You could start one job and if you didn't like it, there was somebody looking for you the next day. I'll give you a job. Come and work with us. The money wasn't huge, but it was a start and you were learning, you were adding to your experience all the time. You didn't dare have any arrogance. You called people Mr. and Mrs. You called people Ma'am and Sir or Miss. All your female teachers were Miss. Your male teachers were Sir. There was no question of ever changing that. You learn to shake hands with people. You learn the art of conversation. You didn't spend your whole day buried in a phone and talk to nobody. You talked to everybody. You learned how to speak to people. You spoke at bus stops. You spoke in the train. Wonderful communication. You learned about other human beings. Yes, you learn to not go with strangers and things like that. But you weren't made to lose your whole childhood worrying about what might happen to you. Dying the death, you would never die. If you saw the police you got out the road, you never, ever, ever would have cheeked up to a policeman. Never. You were taught respect and reverence. You didn't cheek up to your elders and they were called your betters. And you enjoyed your sweeties, your sour plumes that changed your expression. Yes, indeed, folks, the way we were. Now, are we much better off today? The world is a dangerous place but it always has been. Is there still a chance to get on in life? Are there opportunities for young people? When people have made fortunes, are they following that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do they realise that no decent human being should ever die that rich. Because what are you leaving? What my family left me was outstanding and has stood me in great stead all my life. They left me a good name. They left me the memories of people who were thoroughly decent human beings. Who didn't really want for anything. Because they accepted that the only true wealth is life itself. Let me know if you've enjoyed this little blether, wander, a wander along life's rich path. Let me know if you've enjoyed it, and I'll maybe do some more for you. This is Scotty McClue saying thank you to every one of you for being you. Remember, if somebody's got a problem with you, that's their problem. All I can say to you is, dinky-doo.